Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We've finished chapter 13, which is a lengthy chapter in which the Lord gave teaching on the future uh, in the Olivet Discourse. Um, now we're coming to the Passover. We began chapter 14 last week, and we continue with that with chapter tw uh, with uh, verse 12 through verse 21. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. As they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, Surely not I. And he said to them, It is, the one, it is one of the twelve one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. I have a friend who told me of once visiting Indonesia where he and a colleague were driving on a highway. They were traveling well until unexpectedly they had to stop. There was a sign in the road. There are no words on it, just the picture of a human skull. There's no mistaking the message. Danger. Beyond this point, it was a road of death. That's a good picture of the course in life that many people choose. There are warnings, but nevertheless, they choose that path. They think they're choosing a way to happiness or security or a way that is intellectually sound when in reality, they're following a path of death. Well, that's Proverbs 14, verse 12, a proverb that everyone should know, a proverb that young people should memorize. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Those words were never truer of any man than they were of Judas Iscariot, a man of great privilege who was one of the twelve, as Mark has reminded us, who knew the Lord, but left him for money. It's one of the main lessons of our passage in Mark 14, which tells us of Jesus celebrating the Passover with his disciples when he told them, one of you will betray me. It was a shock that one of the twelve, a disciple, could deny the faith and become a traitor. But it happened, and it happens. Judas represents a warning to all against spiritual chutzpah, presumptuousness. Going to church, hearing sermons, knowing the Bible, having Christian friends, Christian parents, doesn't make a Christian, doesn't save. Judas is the sign with a skull. 
Beware of taking his path. Beware of drifting. Beware of unbelief. Its end is the way of death. But that's not the only lesson here. Where there is faith, there is encouragement. Because all of this was part of God's plan. Even Judas's treachery. Proverbs, 4, uh, Proverbs 16 verse 4 says, The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Now that didn't mitigate Judas's crime. He was responsible. But still, God is sovereign. Both of these great truths are taught here in Mark. Jesus put them together when he said, The Son of Man is to go just as it is written, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. We may not be able to harmonize human responsibility with divine sovereignty, at least not harmonize it to our complete satisfaction, and that shouldn't surprise us. We are finite and we are fallible studying the ways of the infinite eternal God. Nevertheless, the two are taught and the two in this passage give a sobering warning on the one hand, but reassuring encouragement on the other. God rules and His will for us is good, always. That's our subject. It was morning on the 14th of Nisan, the seventh month on the Jewish calendar, Thursday morning in the spring of the year 33. Mark calls it the first day of unleavened bread. It was the first day of the combined festivals of Passover and unleavened bread the day when all leaven was cleaned out of the home and the Passover lambs were slaughtered. That evening, the Passover would be celebrated. That meant time was short and the disciples wanted to know where the Lord wanted to have the dinner. So they asked, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Seems like short notice there was a lot to do and little time to do it. But the Lord was in complete command of things. And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. That may not seem very specific to us, but uh, some of the commentators have pointed out that generally women carried water jars. So a man with a pitcher would have been uncommon and a clear signal. Still, the instructions were fairly vague. The Lord gave just enough information that if His disciples would simply follow His directions, they would have no trouble finding the place. But He withheld important details, like the name of the homeowner, the address of the home. And He did that for a reason. He knew the plot of the priests, and he knew that Judas was involved with it. The time of the Passover meal gave them an excellent opportunity to arrest him quietly while the, the people in the city were off the streets and indoors. But the time was not right for the Lord. He still needed to celebrate the Passover and use that feast to say his farewell to the disciples with some very important teaching. It was during the Passover meal that he instituted the Lord's Supper, what we celebrate here every Sunday night. And he gave what is called the Upper Room Discourse, or the Farewell Discourse that's recorded in John chapters 13 through 17, chapter 17 being the great high priestly prayer. 
much remained to be done before his crucifixion. And it was the Lord who was controlling the schedule of things, not the priests or Judas. So to prevent him, prevent Judas from learning the location and disclosing it to the authorities, the Lord kept the details to himself. But he gave the disciples enough information for them to arrive, which they did. I want to pause for a moment to say something about that. The Lord has given us enough information. We have 66 books of the Bible of His revelation, and you can spend the rest of your life studying it and never come to the end of it. You can spend a hundred lives studying the Word of God and never come to the end of it. But it doesn't give us all that we need to know. We can't complete all of our uh, theological ideas and put them all together perfectly. We see that here in this text. We, we can't get it all together and, and in fact we will spend all eternity learning about God and never coming to the end of it. Never learning at all because He's infinite and eternal. And that's what we will do for all eternity, world without end. But we have enough revelation given here to where we can know truth. And we have enough revelation given here, not enough of the will of God to know that if we simply live in obedience to it, if we let this book be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, we will always arrive where we need to arrive. Well, the disciples were given some rather sketchy information, but they followed it, they obeyed, and according to the perfect timing of providence, arrived just as a man carrying a pitcher of water passed by. It happened as the Lord promised, according to His prescience, according to His foreknowledge of events, events planned from the beginning, planned from all eternity, and all according to God's schedule. The Lord's enemies were scheming, but He was in control and determined His destiny. Now that troubles some Christians, that God is in command of the circumstances of life, that He has planned things according to His good purpose of salvation, and that all things are working out according to His will, according to His eternal plan. That troubles people, that troubles Christians. But why? That, that should give encouragement. That should give confidence. Back in, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus told the disciples, let's go over to the other side. But as they were crossing the sea, a storm happened that threatened them. They, they panicked, understandably, but unnecessarily. Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. That was his desire, that was his will, and it cannot be frustrated. They were absolutely safe with him as they learned on that occasion and as they learned on many such occasions. So the doctrine of God's sovereignty is practical. It is very pr practical. Every doctrine is, but the doctrine of the sovereignty of God is a practical doctrine. It is encouraging. But regardless of that, whether you see that or not, whether you understand the practicality of it, whether it impresses you or not, it is the teaching of Scripture. And we see that here in this passage, and even more so as the passage unfolds. That evening, the Lord and His disciples were reclining around the table. According to John's Gospel, Jesus had already washed their feet. Then, while they were eating the Passover meal, the Lord dropped a bombshell. He said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. The news stunned them all, or most all. Mark says they were grieved, and each one began saying to him, surely not I. And that question uh, in the Greek text expects a negative answer. Uh, it expects the Lord to respond 
No, it's not you. No, it's not you. But still, it is a question, and, and it indicates some sense on their part of self-doubt. William Hendrickson called it wholesome distrust. That's true. They were not so self-confident that they felt they could never do such a thing. They knew they were capable of it. That's healthy. Pride goes before destruction. Proverbs 16, verse 18. That's a good one to memorize as well. And one of the ways to guard ourselves from a fall is to recognize that we are all capable of stumbling at any time. We all need to realize that we are weak and we are prone to wander as we sang in our hymn. We're just dust. They knew that. At the same time, the thought of betraying him was so appalling that they thought that surely they would not be guilty of such a thing. But somebody was... The Lord has revealed that, so who was it? And the Lord answers that in verse 20. And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. Now, that's the guy, the one who's dipped with him in the bowl. The problem with that is they had all dipped with him in the common bowl of crushed fruit and vinegar. So it doesn't really identify anyone in particular, but then that was not really the point of what the Lord is saying here. The point is not to expose the guilty person. The point is to expose the base, corrupt conduct of such a person. The traitor was a friend, someone close to him, who had shared a meal, who had actually dipped into the same bowl with him, it heightens the enormity of the crime. And Judas was also physically close to him at the table. It, it's clear from Matthew 26, verse 25, and also from John 13, verse 27, that he was near enough to the Lord to have a conversation with him without being heard by the others. The seating arrangement is not given, but from Matthew and John's Gospels, we get a pretty good idea of where some of the disciples were located. As the text indicates, they were reclining around the table. It, it wasn't the custom in those days to sit in chairs around a table, uh, as we do, but to recline on couches. The usual arrangement at a meal was around a U-shaped table. The, the host was at the center of the link between the two arms of the U. So if you can imagine a table that has these two arms and then is joined by this link that looks like a U, the disciples would be reclining around that. And then in the middle of it is where the Lord would be reclining. So he's at the head of the table would, be, would have been reclining on his left elbow so that his right hand was free to take the bread or different items of the meal with his right hand. And John would have been on his right side because we're told that he was leaning on the Lord's chest. Judas was on the other side. Judas was on the left side, slightly behind him. That was the place of honor. It was given to Judas. Judas is an intriguing person. We know very little about him. But what we know is both instructive and alarming. He was seated in the place of honor when the Lord reveals that a traitor was at the table with him. No one suspected Judas. Even when he left the room, John says that no one expected him of the crime. In fact, they thought he was going out to run an errand for the Lord. And he was, but not the errand that they thought. He was evidently a highly respected man. 
He was the man they all trusted to be their treasurer. He carried the money box. We can imagine that he was a very intelligent man, an insightful man. They had complete confidence in him. That is, in large part, what makes his betrayal such a heinous crime. When Julius Caesar was betrayed by his friend and protege, Brutus, and lay dying on the floor of the Senate, Shakespeare gave his dying words as, Et tu, Brute? You too, Brutus? According to the Roman historian Suetonius, he said, You too, my child? He was shocked that, that his friend turned on him. It, it made the murder even more terrible. And that's the idea here. Brutus was the last person Caesar would have suspected of putting a knife in him. But that's the nature of treason. It is unexpected. It is deception. It is committed by those who are trusted. When David wrote of his betrayal by Ahithophel during the uh, revolt of Absalom, he wrote of it in Psalm 41, and he writes of it as well with a sense of surprise. Even my close friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. The Lord's betrayal was unexpected by everyone, everyone but the Lord himself. He wasn't surprised. He knew what was coming. He exposed it, not to stop it, but to strengthen the disciples. That's what he said in John 13, verse 19. He revealed it to them for their benefit so that when it happened, they would know he had foretold it and know that he is the Christ, the Son of God, who's in complete control. He knew about all of this in advance because it was ordained by God. It was all part of his eternal plan of salvation and it had been prophesied in Scripture. The Lord said that, verse 21. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of Him, meaning it has been prophesied of Him in the Scriptures, and the Lord studied the Scriptures and studied these prophecies all His life. He knew them. He knew them from His diligent study and His understanding of the Word of God. Well, you might ask, where was that prophesied? Where do we find this prophecy of his death? Well, we find it in a number of places. We find it, for example, in Psalm 22 that gives a lengthy description of his agony and the actions of his executioners. They pierced my hands and feet. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. That was 1,000 years before the crucifixion, and yet you read that and you know exactly what's taking place on the cross and at the foot of the cross from that prophecy and psalm that David wrote. Isaiah 53 is a clear prophecy of the Lord's crucifixion. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Also, Zechariah 13, verse 7, "...strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered." Then the Jewish sacrificial system itself is a, a visual prophecy of his death with the, the slaughter of bulls and goats and lambs on the altar. The Passover itself was a, a type or prophetic picture of Christ. That which they were celebrating was a picture of what was about to take place when the Lamb of God would be slain. Everything was foretold in the Old Testament because it had all been ordained from eternity. It was God's plan. Christ knew it. He came to fulfill it. In Luke 22, verse 22, he made that equally clear when he said, For indeed the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But then he added, Woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. That is in Mark's account as well. But he adds the words, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Now that's the other side of things. Human responsibility. And all through this, 
The Lord has been making gracious appeals to Judas, giving him opportunities to stop and repent with the warnings he has given. The revelation that one of them was a traitor was a clear signal to him. It was a, a, a signal that the Lord knew about the plot, and it gave Judas an opportunity to pause, to reflect, to realize that he had been found out and turn from his deed. Even at this last hour, the, the Lord was reaching out to Judas. Now, that doesn't undermine the sovereignty of God in predestination. Now, putting that together with human responsibility may, may be difficult for us. It, it may seem incomprehensible, but Scripture teaches both. And here it is clear that in God's eternal, all-comprehensive decree that there is a place for warning even those who ultimately will be lost. God is not indifferent to the unbeliever. He's not uncaring about their end. In Ezekiel 18, he says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, therefore repent and live. That is a general call to the unbeliever, repent and live. And that's what Judas is offering, or rather Jesus is offering Judas here. The, the warning here is genuine. And it, it continues with the alarming revelation of his destiny. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Now that gives us another doctrine that is unpopular today and denied by many, the doctrine of eternal punishment. It's not a topic today for polite company, as they say. Uh, many believe in universalism, the doctrine that none will be lost, all will be saved. But if all men are ultimately received by God into eternal blessing, it would not be better not to have been born. The Lord's statement is consistent only with everlasting punishment. That is what he was speaking of. It is a dreadful doctrine, which should have kindled a healthy fear in Judas, but it didn't. Not even when the Lord makes his final gesture as recorded by John and gives him the, the sop, the morsel, the, the bread. Not even then did he repent. He was resolved to betray him. He had chosen his path for 30 pieces of silver and would not turn back. He was an unbelieving man. He had never been born again. That, that is indicated by his response in Matthew 26, verse 25. Because when all of the disciples were saying, Surely not I, Lord. He said, Surely not I, Rabbi. It recalls Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It, it was as though Judas couldn't call Him Lord. And so in between verses 21 and 22, he left the room. John's description of his departure is sobering. He wrote, So after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. Why did he give us that little identification of time? And it was night. It was night outside the room. And it was night inside his soul. How did it happen? How do we explain Judas? John gives us some insight. First of all, Satan. In John 13, verse 2, he wrote that at, at some point, the devil had put in Judas's heart to betray Christ. And then 
when he received the morsel that Jesus gave him in, in that last attempt to turn him from the, the way of death, John wrote in verse 27 that Satan then entered into him. Satan knew at that moment that Judas had hardened his heart in his resolve to carry out the deed. That's when he entered him. But he entered a man who decided the way of betrayal was the right way for him. But more importantly, Jesus knew it. Judas had rejected the Lord's appeal. Rather than reject the morsel, he took it. He accepted his role as a traitor. And he did so with his eyes wide open. And Christ was not surprised. John writes that after the morsel, he told Judas, what you do, do quickly. He knew Judas had made his decision. There was no turning him back from it. Judas was no pawn in a game. He made a fatal decision early on by not rejecting the wicked idea that Satan had put in his heart. He'd opened himself up to Satan's influence. No one comes under the influence of the devil or the world or any other persuasion who has not first opened himself or herself up to it and done so by neglecting God's word and God's counsel. It begins when people become careless and when they begin to drift. Sin is not to be tolerated. Ideas must be controlled. Now, as I think about that statement, I'll repeat it again. It's true. Ideas have to be controlled, but that is difficult. That is a very difficult thing to control our thoughts. You're you're sitting at your desk and suddenly you realize your mind is on things it shouldn't be on. You're driving down the road and suddenly you realize you've been thinking about things that are wrong. And you think, where does this come from? And you're in it before you know it. It is a difficult thing to control our thoughts. But ideas must be controlled. And the only way, the only effective antidote to that is Scripture. Setting our minds on the things above, not the things that are on earth. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Psalm 119, verse 11. That's the antidote. Treasuring, hiding in our hearts the word of God. Judas didn't treasure the word of God. And then Judas realized he didn't believe the word of God. Beware of unbelief. Divine sovereignty and human, human responsibility are clear, clearly taught. Judas wasn't coerced. He wasn't a victim. He made his own choice freely. Yet it all fit into God's eternal plan. We see that in all of this. Jesus could have stopped Judas. He could have done that at the, that very moment. He could have said, there's the man. Stop him before he gets out the door. Didn't do that. He sent him out the door. So at Christ's command, Judas went out on his mission that actually accomplished the Lord's will and served God's purpose. God, as the psalmist said, makes the wrath of man to praise him. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Proverbs 16, 14. There is a general warning in all of this. These people exist in the church. The apostles warn of wolves and false teachers, those who are not really of us, we're to be on guard. There are tares among the wheat, as Jesus described them. Judas was that. The, the, the Lord knew who and what he was, but the others ha didn't have a clue. They will be among us. 
But it's not for us to weed them out. Christ warns against that. We can't see into the hearts of people. We can only examine ourselves. We can only examine our own hearts. And we can only make our calling and election sure, as Peter says in 2 Peter 1.10. That's the lesson Judas gives us. He was privileged. He was a disciple, a close companion of Christ. He had witnessed miracles. He had heard the greatest sermons ever preached. He even served the Lord. Three years he was with him. But he was lost. His heart had never been changed. That makes this a personal warning. You can come to church. You can have Christian friends study the Bible and be lost because you've never been born again. Judas had never believed. He did not like orthodoxy. He did not like truth. What's the solution? It's simple. Believe. Trust in Christ for salvation. And guard your heart with God's Word. Believe it and treasure it in your heart. All of it, even predestination. Believe it when it challenges your notions of of right and wrong. It is, as the psalmist said, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It's the path of faith. It's the way of life and the way of real encouragement. What, What is more encouraging than God's sovereignty? He's in control. Would you rather have a world in which no God is in control? He's in control. He would not be God if He were not in control. And He's working all things together for the good of His people. Together for your good at every moment. Do you believe that? It's the teaching of Scripture. Believe it. And believe the doctrine of perdition. Endless punishment. It's the destiny of unbelievers and it would be our destiny except God sovereignly gives life to the spiritually dead and He gives faith to the unbelieving. Only He can. If you are unbelieving, then you value Jesus no more highly than Judas did, worth betraying for 30 pieces of silver. That will cost you your soul. Repent. Judas is a warning sign, a skull. He is the way of unbelief. Look to Christ. He is the way of faith. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He will receive you through faith and faith alone. Look to Him and live. And may God encourage all of us who have looked to Him and trust in Him. May God help you you to do it. May help all of us to do that. Why don't we end with one of the great hymns in our Songs of Praise book. Let's stand and sing hymn number 14. Wonderful, merciful Savior, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 14. Lord, by your grace, we will someday fall before your throne and give praise for that wonderful, merciful Savior that we have. Thank you for him. May we live for him. May we live for him daily. We pray these things in his name. Amen.